Hello everyone, my name is Soro Locatelli, I'm Quantitative Analyst at Pinnacle Advisory Group and today we're going to talk about quantitative analysis. I joined Pinnacle uh, about a year ago and since then my role has gradually shaped into the one of quantitative analyst. At the same time as Pinnacle started to increasingly rely on this type of analysis to support the other components of our investment process. So today, I would like to give you an introduction to quantitative analysis. I will explain what it is and why it is so important and widespread these days. And I will conclude by giving you a practical example of how we use it on a daily basis at Pinnacle. But let's start from the beginning. It is easier to understand what quantitative analysis means when we put it in contrast with qualitative analysis, which is exactly what these guys that you see on the screen do every day, and by the way, in case you don't know, these are the members of our investment team. What they do is they read reports, they follow the market, they look at charts and numbers, and uh, ultimately they come up with ideas and make investment decisions based on what they see. So we can say that the main features of qualitative analysis are an investment that is predominantly in human capital. Uh, it is a process that involves a big deal of subjective judgment and um, gut reaction, why not? And uh, for this reason, it is subject to a multitude of errors that are typical of the human mind. And don't get me wrong, these pictures on the screen may not inspire too much confidence, but these guys are actually very smart and they do a fantastic job. The only problem is that, as I said, they are human. On the other hand, when we think about quantitative analysis, we think about computers. The information that the guys on our investment team absorb by looking at charts and reading market reports is now converted into a string of numbers and analyzed by a computer using advanced mathematical and statistical sciences. Here the investment is uh, predominantly in technology and as I said the methodology relies heavily on computers, mathematics and statistics. The end result is a process that is highly objective and virtually immune to the typical pitfalls of the human judgment. However, it is not flawless it actually has some potentially important flaws specific to the way the data is recorded and analyzed, and we must be aware of this. The bottom line here is that neither qualitative nor quantitative analysis are perfect. They both have their own benefits and limitations, and that is why we use them together so that they complement each other. The main reason why quantitative analysis has become so widespread in recent times is simple, it has to do with information. We live in an era of globalization and digitalization where new information is being produced at rapidly increasing rates and circulates all around the globe 24 hours a day. This also increases the amount of historical information being stored in databases. As a result of this information explosion, it becomes increasingly difficult to separate useful information from useless one, also known as noise. And this is what we mean by low signal to noise ratio. In this environment, the human brain is simply not enough to deal with this information explosion. As someone said, there are simply too many rocks to turn over one by one. And that is why we need the support of technology to find, store, and uh, most importantly, analyze this huge pile of information. The second reason why quant is so important these days is that since the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008, the rules of the game seem to have changed. Market indicators that were once highly trusted are now considered to be unreliable and models that worked for decades are now broken. In times like this, it is extremely important to challenge the conventional wisdom and reassess the effectiveness of our tools with a fresh mind and with the aid of the pure mathematical and statistical evidence. And uh, quantitative analysis allows us exactly to do this. At Pinnacle, we utilize two main sources of quantitative analysis. On one side, we have our independent research providers. These organizations have been running models for decades and have been very successful at it. We pay them big bucks to share their work with us, and it is worth all of it because it gives us access to a level of expertise that is unmatched in the industry. On the other hand, as already mentioned, traditional models are coming under great pressure these days, and it is therefore important to question what these models are saying instead of blindly trusting them. That's where our own proprietary work comes into play, which is the second source of quantitative analysis at Pinnacle. 
Through our own work, we have the ability to test the statistical significance of pretty much any indicator. And uh, this certainly increases the amount of confidence that we can place in the indicators that we choose to follow. The next step is the creation of our own models. Once we're able to find a number of unique factors that we believe to have a significant relationship with the same given variable, for example, the returns of the S&P 500 index, we can put these factors together and create a new single indicator whose power is greater than the sum of its parts. So what does it mean in practice to do quantitative analysis? It ultimately boils down to two main points, which we can call the two pillars of quantitative analysis. First, as I already mentioned, we're looking for statistical relationships in the data, which we technically call correlations. And uh, correlation is simply a measure of how two separate variables tend to move together. Consider, for example, two generic variables A and B. If A tends to go up when B goes up, we say that A and B are positively correlated. On the other hand, if A tends to go down when B goes up, we say that they're negatively correlated. Now, we not only want to measure the sign and magnitude of the correlation, we also want to establish whether the correlation is statistically significant which is a fancy word to say that we estimate the probability that the correlation that we're observing occurs simply by chance. Once we find a statistically significant correlation, we have to determine whether a causation effect exists, which is ultimately what we're looking for. In fact, the second pillar of quantitative analysis states that correlation does not imply causation. Causation means that not only two variables tend to move together, but one of them is actually causing movement in the other. And let me give you an example. If you have ever traveled by plane, you will have noticed that there's a pretty high correlation between the times that the seatbelt sign is on and the amount of turbulence that you experience during the flight. Now, it will be kind of tough to argue that the seatbelt sign is actually causing the turbulence. So how do we determine whether the correlation we found is the result of a causation effect? The general rule is that there has to be an explanation for the correlation, which in our field must be derived from economic theory or at least common sense. Whenever a correlation cannot be explained, it is likely to either have occurred by chance or that the correlation between variables A and B is actually caused by a common third variable C that we haven't discovered yet. Now that we have covered the basic principles of quantitative analysis, let me give you a couple of examples of how we utilize it on a daily basis at Pinnacle. In the first example, we're going to look at the ISM Manufacturing Index, which is a widely followed indicator of growth in the US manufacturing sector. It is a very intuitive indicator. When it goes up, it means that growth in the manufacturing sector is accelerating, and vice versa, when it goes down, it means that growth is slowing. It is perhaps because of this intuitive appeal that so many people follow it and tend to get bullish when this index is going up and bearish when it is going down. So since we said that we want to challenge conventional wisdom, we're going to use quantitative analysis to test whether a significant relationship exists between the ISM manufacturer index and the S&P 500. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to skip the intermediate steps of the analysis and just take a brief look at the output table of the linear regression. Um, and I don't expect the audience to be familiar with this type of table, but it will suffice to say that these numbers indicate that a significant relationship does exist. However, it is an inverse relationship, which means that the S&P 500 actually does better when the ISM manufacturing is lower and vice versa. This goes directly against the conventional wisdom about this particular indicator. The level of statistical confidence here is 99.99%, which means that statistically there is only one chance out of 10,000 that a result of this magnitude happened by chance, which is clearly a very powerful result. In the second example, we're going to look at euro dollar futures. And don't get confused here, the term has nothing to do with the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar. It actually refers to dollar denominated deposits at European banks and it is something that existed before the creation of the euro currency. This is a very unintuitive indicator, and in fact, we know only of one person, one of our independent research providers, who looks at it, 
and he claims that Euro dollar futures tend to lead the S&P 500 by about one year. Once again, we skip the intermediate steps of the analysis and go straight to the results to find out that Euro dollar futures do in fact lead the S&P 500 by about one year with a very high level of statistical significance. This is a great example of a data point that you wouldn't even bother looking at if you didn't have quantitative analysis tell you that this is in fact a great indicator for the S&P 500. At this point, we have seen two indicators that were tested for a potential relationship with the S&P 500. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go over uh, more uh, individual indicators, but I would like to conclude by giving you an overview of our proprietary S&P 500 model. We currently have 18 factors in the model belonging to the different categories that you can see in the pie chart. The number 18 is not a magic number, but it's simply a function of the number of high quality factors that we are able to find. The model is dynamic, meaning that its composition is not set in stone, but we actually have some mechanisms in place which allow the model to adapt itself to the most recent economic and market conditions. The goal is to forecast the direction of the S&P 500 over the following six month period. And since 2007, we have seen a strong correlation between the model and the S&P 500. The current signal is neutral, meaning that based on these 18 factors, the model is not finding enough quantitative evidence to either get bullish or bearish. That concludes our brief overview of quantitative analysis.